Okay, so we've introduced ourselves, we've introduced the content and the series and where we are, where we've been, where we're going. Um, now we're on page six and um, you can scroll down to page six or you can click on objectives and agenda in the left hand margin and it'll take you right there. Um, do I have a volunteer to read out our objectives for today? I can do that. Um, participants will strengthen our understanding of social emotional factors that affect multilingual learner achievement and practice identifying social emotional factors that affect multilingual learners. Thank you so much. Yes, that is what I'm hoping that we all get out of it today. That is the intention. Um, and so what we've done so far is we've done the welcome, we've set the stage. Um, from here, we'll kind of, we'll, we'll move into some community values that we'll try to agree to uphold during our 90 minutes together today. Um, from there, we'll go into some example dialogue starters that'll help us uphold those community values. From there, we'll go into our key concepts, we'll review key concepts from this morning session. If you were here or if you weren't, we'll all start on the same page. Um, and then from there, we'll, we'll really dig into different social emotional learning factors, um, some legal factors, some political factors, the current political landscape. Um, again, it is very, it's heavy stuff, but it's the afternoon, we'll, we'll go through it as, as afternoon paced Leah as we can. And um, from there, we'll, we'll look at some um, example multilingual learner student profiles. Um, if we have time, we'll come up with some example students from our own programs or our own experiences. Um, and we'll close from there. If we have time because of our group size, we'll go one step further and I'll bring in some content from um, the third module in the multilingual learner training project series and we'll look at some actual strategies for um, supporting the academic and linguistic development of multilingual learners. If we don't have time, which I don't know if we will in 90 minutes, um, we will just stay with this unit, which is um, our um, factor uh, the with the social to go with the social emotional learning factors we'll provide some strategies uh, and a toolkit and action planning template for building safe and inclusive spaces for our multilingual learners and our newcomer students and <coughs> which is also very applicable to staff members and um, one thing i would love to share is there was one time i was facilitating this material and it turned out that one of the participants in the room um, and uh, this was this was all one team from the same agency, and they didn't um, they didn't know this. We all learned this together that day. That one of the, uh, one of the staff members actually was um, a newcomer, um, new to the English language, new to working in um, San Jose, in California, in the United States. And so it was a really interesting experience um, hearing those perspectives and also being able to. Um, translate everything that we were learning about program and our students to even how do we interact with each other and ourselves and how do we make our team spaces and our work spaces as inclusive and supportive and uplifting, <coughs> excuse me, as we possibly can. Um, so with all of that said, I'm going to transition us um, onto page seven which um, is the community agreements page. I'm gonna drink water in a second. Um, I'm going to invite you to um, look through this page um, by yourself for a moment, um, see what resonates, see if, there is, uh, if there's dissonance, if there's anything that you'd like to add or edit or um, omit. Um, we're going to build whatever community values we want to hold for our community for the 90 minutes um, that we can all agree to. So um, take a moment to read those. I'm going to drink some water because my throat's itchy um, and we'll regroup in two minutes, 1.35.
And if as you're reading, you see anything you want to add or edit, um, feel free to type that into the chat box or um, write it directly into our Google Doc. That's why we have it. Um, or feel free to raise your hand and, and share out loud on the microphone. One invitation that I always like to add um, at this point is um, an invitation to for care, compassion, and respect. Um, and this is for ourselves and each other. Um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier that um, whether it's biological needs to take care of or whether it's social, emotional, um, or memory type experiences that are arising for ourselves, feel free to step away whenever you need. It's um, six hours of content squished into 90 minutes. There are not breaks built in. Um, there's break before and break after. Um, so um, help yourself when you need a break. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess I already prefaced the content as well. It can be heavy. It's really, really, really dense. Um, I will say that it's a lot of text on these next pages. Um, and that's not always uh, friendly for all learning styles. I know it's it's a lot for me. <laughs> um, I'm a kinesthetic learner myself. Um, so um, feel free to also, um, you can message me privately um, if you need, need or would like any accommodations for that. We'll do our best to not just read straight from the material. Again, that's why we're in our Zoom space together and we have the document so that we can be as interactive as possible during this time. Um, so I just want to preface that, that it's not just like emotional and mental content, but it's also just a lot, a lot, a lot of text content. Um, moving forward from there, if there aren't any other um, objections, actually, before I move on, um, can I just get a some uh, thumbs up emojis if, um, if we do all agree to those community values as is? Awesome. Okay, super. Thank you. I definitely want to make sure we're all um, we're all in in consent before moving on. Um, and if, if as we go, anything comes up that you want to add or edit um, or request that we all agree to, by all means, please feel free to to pause, um, stop us, and um, and invite us to to add add a new community value to our space. Um, on page. Eight of our Google Doc, we have some dialogue starters. These are just examples. There's many more possibilities. Um, if you have any ideas, please throw those in the chat so that we can add them to our um, to our doc, add them to our list, and um, grow and learn from each other. Um, these are just to help us with with that like, respect and care and compassion component. Um, these are ways to respect ourselves. If something does arise for us, maybe something hits us a certain way or um, the impact wasn't necessarily what was intended, um, but it honors us, like how we were impacted because it gives us um, a way to say something rather than just letting it go. But it also, um, gives us a way to say something so that we're not accusing or placing blame or antagonizing um, the person that did impact us a certain way. Um, these examples are um, asking for clarification, for example, would you please say what you mean by, um, and approaching the situation with curiosity, um, an inquisitive nature instead of um, pointing fingers. Um, other examples are, I'd like to share another perspective on that, or I felt this, or in my experience, this. And these are all examples of ways to um, respect ourselves and respect the others in the space um, by giving us voice and also giving um, benefit of the doubt. On page nine, we have our key concepts for this unit. Um, may I have a volunteer read out um, one or all of the key concepts on page nine?
I can go ahead and do that for you. Thank you. So the topic, introduction and key concepts, so diversity of experiences. Each multilingual learner has many layers to their experience and background and may have different needs accordingly. Many various social emotional factors can play a role in ML's life. The opportunity out of school programs have tremendous opportunity to build from the deep caring relationships that already exist between staff and youth to learn more about their multilingual learners. Program implications. It is important for us to become familiar with these social emotional factors to better understand how to create safe and supportive program community environments, especially for multilingual learners. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, exactly. So this is where we're going to, uh, what we're going to be working with this afternoon. Um, on page 10, we can see where we came from this morning. Um, the diversity and experience, we talked about um, the multilingual learner and newcomer population is a very diverse group with all sorts of varying needs. There's no um, one way to be a multilingual learner. There's no one kind of background that our newcomer students come from. Um, a lot of different um, a lot of different strengths come with them, a lot of different assets, um, as well as thus different needs and different um, ways we need to support our students. Um, the, we, we talked about why we use the term multilingual learner as opposed to English learner. Um, that is a term that is, multilingual learner is a term that is widely used in California and spreading um, in other places as well. It, honors the fact that our, um, our students who are coming to us, um, non-native English speaking students, are not just learning English, they're also learning and developing in whatever language or languages they're learning and using at home. So it honors the, the strengths, the power, the assets that comes with these students, these learners, um, uh, without just saying that they're um, you know, an English learner only, because they're they're bringing so much more than that. Um, the English learner is still the federal um, classification, so um, our the students do get that uh, do get la labeled or classified in that way um, from the United States government. Um, but that we're using the term, and and it's becoming more and more widely adopted, the the multilingual learner. Um, so. Yeah, with, with that as our foundation, um, we're going to start adding more and more and more layers. Um, the opportunity, as we got to hear um, a little bit um, just now, is really this special magic. Um, I don't know if I sound cliche. I don't know if you heard me this. I don't know if you were here this morning and you heard me say it already, but um, I, as educators, whether we're in classrooms, as we're, if we're administrators, if we're leadership, um, and those in the uh, out of school time professionals, extended learning time professionals, um, we have this really special power and privilege and position with our youth and children, these very special relationships, these special bonds, we might be the their favorite adult or their the the reason they come to school, the reason they come to program, the reason they get up in the day, that they're um, the only adult that they trust. Um, and with that, we have this really special place to build from and grow from, learn from our students, uh, while um, learning how to best support them, learning where they're coming from, um, and while they're able to develop trust with us and learn from us. Um, and it just really goes hand in hand to, to um, feeding that relationship and that development and that learning. And, and that creation of that safe space, that safe and inclusive um, environment, the brave space. On page 11, um, we see the social emotional factors for multilingual learners introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll introduce the key concept. Often when multilingual learners are not succeeding academically or in their language development, it might seem that what is needed is academic help um, or language development support. 
really what's underlying everything might not be academic at all. It might be the social emotional factors um, that are behind everything. So these factors are broken down and, and for our purpose, they're broken down into nine big categories that are divided into or categorized into kind of three umbrella categories. So for this, and this is where it does get very text heavy, um, we will see three psychological factors, five social economic factors, and then one legal political factor, followed by some of the current political landscape um, that has kind of been building um, and brewing uh, over the past few years and, and past few, few leadership, uh, national leadership turnovers, I guess. Um, so um, yeah, for this next section, it goes on for quite a few pages, starting on page 12. The way that with a larger group, I think that what we would do is we would break into groups and kind of teach each other um, what, what all were, so that nobody has to read the whole thing. Um, I think because we're very, we're, we're a nice, solid, um, compact group, I think that, that it's still gonna be quite a lot of reading if we do it that way. Um, if we do it, it'll be a lot for a teach back. So I'm, I'm thinking, Hmm. I just, I want it to be as comfortable as possible. I know we're in the afternoon. We've, we've gone through the morning sessions. We've gone through um, multiple workshops and um, panels and whatnot already in keynotes. Um, Let's do, just for everyone's own pace, let's do like just a self skim of all, all nine of the categories. So it's just self, uh, like, I guess sustained silent reading for, for lack of a better expression um, for maybe, it is a lot of content. So let's say it all the way until two o'clock, um, we'll just read through or skim. Feel free to highlight parts that stand out to you. And maybe that way, some of our, some of our peers, some of the, the rest of us in the room that uh, will see that and like comment on that. Or So feel free to interact with the document in whatever way breaks it up as comfortably as possible. If there are any challenges with the text heaviness, the reading, um, please message me uh, so that we can um, work out another strategy and accommodation. Um, but yeah, I think that that'll be nice, chill afternoon reading maybe. It's, it's a chill for lack of a better word also. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll mute myself. Please feel free to read, get water, whatever is going to be comfortable. And um, again, an invitation to if you need to step out, because of the heavy content um, or anything that arises for you. Um, feel free, take care of your needs, um, respect your needs and give compassion to yourself. And um, we're all in this together. Thank you. Um, based on these nine factors that we looked at, um, there are a few different ways to um, keep those in mind and, and as, as we design program or design program elements um, and ways that we interact with our, um, our youth, our children. So with culture shock and transition, um, consider how the programming can create practices to support newcomers with adjusting to a new environment and or connect with the school day to learn more about the um, what's going on in the school program to support um, newcomers. With cultural mismatch, culture clash, and cultural identity, um, it's very helpful to create or expand programming that builds on and affirms young people's cultures um, so that 
goes into student voice, youth voice, youth leadership, having um, really involving the participants in the, the choices that the program design, what elements do we do, what activities do we do, um, and really involving that voice as much as possible and having those activities and the course content, um, the subject material really align with um, experiences that youth can relate to, um, pieces of their own lives. Um, in response to trauma, um, it can become our, our role often to connect youth and families to social services and or implement trauma awareness training for program staff. Um, this also is really important. Um, I mean, this is why self-care has become a big buzzword is uh, burnout is a very real thing. Um, and it is always really important for us to remind ourselves what our boundaries are and that we are not the sole carrier of the weight of the world, but also, but we are the connector, we can be the bridge, we can be the, uh, the support um, and, and all of that, but we don't have to be the only bearer of um, all of the, the weight and the, the work. Um, another thing that I'd like to add when it comes to trauma-informed teaching, trauma-informed care, and these buzzwords, um, that there has um, been proven practices um, and, and program quality improvement um, advancing with a shift from um, trauma-informed to going beyond that to being healing-centered in our approach. So not just looking at trauma, which comes from a deficit um, mindset or a deficit outlook, but healing centered, which is an asset based approach, looks at the, the strengths, looks at um, what's, what's there, what's, um, yeah, what's, what's working well and what to build on rather than what's just missing or what's just bad, um, rather than reliving trauma or working through, just digging through, digging through, digging through, working on, um, all that is good, all of the successes, all of the triumph, um, viewing what we've come out of, not just what we've gone through. Um, so um, going into the kind of legal aspect of things um, and the political and the physical um, relocating and migrating and immigrating experience, um, immigration as an unaccompanied minor, this does definitely add um, add some up to some of the hats that we wear. Um, we become our youth's advocates. We become, um, we support them with things that um, maybe traditionally a guardian or a family member might um, help with, but with when our with our students whose family members do not um, are not native English speakers or are not familiar with the system or are not even in the United States with them, um, we often become that um, again, that bridge, that connector, that support system, um, helping with assignments when they don't get um, homework help at home or helping connect them to the resources where they can get that help um, so that we're not stretching ourselves as thin as um, we often feel compelled to do. Um, arriving as, at a, as an adolescent, um, this is um, this calls us to consider how to more intentionally support our youth with their basic academic skills um, when there is a gap, um, and also to, to pay very close attention to when maybe when there isn't a gap um, and look at the strengths that they're building, how are they progressing, um, and not just looking um, on the surface, but really be reading between the lines, noticing when our students are um, very um, speaking very fluidly, playground English, being able to communicate with each other socially, speaking very well, um, but not necessarily matching um, their spoken literacy with their reading comprehension or their writing comprehension. Um, and on the flip side, noticing um, not just assuming that maybe their English is not that good, their spoken English maybe has a strong accent still. And so assuming that they're not progressing academically or at a lower level than they actually are. So really paying attention to the student. And that calls us to really 
ask. We have to, there's no way for us to just know on the surface. We have to talk to our students and that leans again on our magical, powerful educator or out of school time professional relationships and bonds and rapport and trust with those students. Um, being able to ask, being able to create that trust and that um, partnership in learning where we're, we're all learning, we're all growing and thus we're all um, able to that much better develop together, our, our staff, our students, ourselves. Um, with family separation and reunification, um, this is definitely a, um, a time when um, after school programs and um, classrooms, school day classrooms really become that um, opportunity for consistency. It's one of the reasons why routine is so important. Structure is so important. Um, so that students know what to expect. They're not caught off guard. Things are not changing all the time, um, but really having routine, really having structure um, and a strong culture that they can expect each day um, in that community, in that space. Um, another note on family separation and reunification is a lot of notions of what family is may be different in different cultures and communities. So oftentimes our multilingual or our newcomer students will be um, coming from a community or a place where um, extended family members are just as um, valued, just as close, just as tight knit as um, what in the United States might be viewed as a nuclear family. So family separation and reunification um, from uh, family separation from an uncle or a neighbor or a cousin or um, a second cousin or a you know an, multiple layers of um, of family might feel just as hard and hurt just as much and be just as much on a, a weighing on a, a child or youth's mind as if um, we were separated from um, an immediate family member um, in the United States culture view of, of family. Um, so those are other things to really pay attention to is how much that could be distracting a student or um, inhibiting a student from keeping up with homework assignments or really being able to be present and engaged during class or program. With transnationalism, um, it's really, really, really um, helpful for us to be as connected as possible out of school time, school day, um, and any other resources to fill in any gaps in schooling um, and any gaps in consistency that are caused by students moving back and forth a lot, extended periods of absence, um, and that straddling to two locations, two cultures, two very different worlds or more than two. Um, with the economics and the work and the family responsibilities, it really becomes our role to, again, be an advocate for our students, um, connect them to as many resources and opportunities as possible, and really advocate for our students who may be challenged to keep up with school because of the work and economic responsibilities or caring for siblings or family members or neighbors or cousins. Um, with legal status, safety is a big concern for undocumented students and families. This is, um, this really shows up when there's parent meetings or caregiver meetings or things like that, where it really doesn't feel safe for a family member to come to campus. Um, oftentimes our students who um, are, are um, undocumented, if they, or even students who um, are not undocumented, but have family members who do not speak English fluently, um, there's that barrier and uh, to coming to speak to the teacher even when um, to ask for help on an assignment or to clarify a grade or some of these things where our um, native speaking uh, students and their family members are really there and, uh, and active in the communication, active in the community, um, that involvement is different. Um, and oftentimes that's because of the fear of um, fear for safety, fear for um, not being able to communicate um, and all of the different things that come with that. And so it's really up to, to us to, to be mindful of that and be um, as in tune and, and attentive to that as possible. 
Um, yeah, yes, sorry. And I um, missed the chat box, um, but yes, this that really goes with this of the weight um, and the trauma and the extra um, load that our students who are becoming that interpreter and that translator, that middle person um, that they have to carry. I, um, be before my current role was doing a lot of college access work. And I had a student uh, whose home language was Farsi and my seventh grader was translating for her mom in every single grade um, meeting or parent teacher conference. And she was tired all the time. She had very little energy left to do her homework or do her band practice or do all of these things because she was constantly mediating conversations between her mother and her teacher or the principal or the band director or anybody who ever needed to talk to a uh, home. And so um, that is a huge factor for our students and really does affect their um, then their, you know, their energy, so thus their con con concentration, um, which affects learning development, language development, social and emotional interaction with um, peers, classmates. Um, it just really changes the, the, the dynamics for um, that youth or that child. That's a perfect segue, actually. So that, that little example um, of my, one of my students, um, but that's a perfect segue for us to go back into um, our Google document now on page, or actually I'll pause really quickly. Did anybody else, um, did anything else stand out that, that somebody wants to point out um, from any of those pages or any other comments to add, any other questions before we move on to our next activity? I'll just add that I really appreciate all the information. Um, it's just really thoughtful. And um, I feel like it's things that we know, but when you see them all just side by side and, and consider the cumulative experience that our students are carrying, I think it's really uh, compelling. And I'm, I'm just sitting with, you know, how do we um, cascade this information. I, I'm a provider, so to our, our team members, right, who are working directly with students um, who can benefit from, you know, uh, this information. So thank you. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I do almost feel like this text, the giant text block, the pages and pages of text is almost symbolic of of the experience of just that overwhelm and that like, whoa, what do I do? All this information, what is going on? And like, how do I, how do I read this fine print? And um, so it, it is almost a symbolic parallel to, to see it all there in that way. And like you said, seeing it all together and, and the, how all the different possible combinations of experiences that there could be. And we know that these aren't even, aren't even everything that we could imagine, so. Um, thank you very much for, for um, pointing that out. Um, for this next part, and um, this would also normally be in small groups, but I think that because our group has small, um, gotten smaller and smaller, we can do this all together, um, either on microphone or by um, chat box or directly into our Google document. But on these next few pages, we actually have five um, different youth profiles. Um, so for this, for this one, um, the, the idea is to read these different students' experiences. And these are based on real, real students' experiences. Um, their names have been changed for, for privacy. Um, but these Going off of these experiences, our, our role is to pick out some different things and guess or, or like bank our best, um, I don't know, I don't have a better word than guess, <laughs> but so really kind of, kind of um, figure out or deduce, I guess maybe would be a better word, uh, what social emotional factors um, or legal or political implications these students may be experiencing. Um, and, I'll jump to the punchline, but ultimately 
Um, the reason I said yes is uh, I didn't have a better word because even with these information and we can pick out the objective facts, so much of what we know has to come from the student. We cannot make assumptions based on only on observations. We can definitely begin with observations and use observations to um, build a foundation of understanding. And, and it's observations that we can take with us when we approach a conversation with a child or youth. Um, but it's, it's um, we have to be very careful to not make assumptions or make opinions based on the observations, the, the very, the clear cut facts. Um, so I guess because of our group size, we'll just, we'll do um, one by, well, I don't know, we don't need to try to do all five. Let's just start with number one. We'll start with Na um, Nayeli's story. Um, and I, I I don't know how how fast we all are at reading. So let's, we'll check in at 220. Um, so about three minutes to, to just, to skim Nayeli's story, highlight anything that stands out and drop in the chat box or in the note box on page 20. Um, the the different possible factors that might be um, a part of Nayeli's experience. So, and if it's easier, you can just write the number that corresponds with the factor, um, or if you want to write more extensive notes, um, or the write out the, the name of the factor. That's totally okay too. So now I'll invite you to spend another three minutes on um, case number three, May's story on page 22. And another three minutes for um, Osvaldo's story number four. And 
Jess's story number five, if we get to it so that at 2.30, um, we can kind of go over all of our notes from um, story one, three, four, and five, or as many of those that we um, got to during this time. Oh, no worries, Tanya. Thanks for saying so. Welcome back. Um, we're, we're on um, the case studies, the student stories, um, starting on page 20 with Nayeli's story. And we're reading those profiles just to kind of get a sense of their experiences and note down what, um, what we think that their stories indicate are, their, are the factors that might be part of their experiences. So from, um, well, we can't, we, we, um, Abdul Rab is very similar to a story we, we already talked about. Um, so we're looking at number, um, well, we're looking at Nayeli and May and Osvaldo and Jessa. And, um, and at 2.30, we'll uh, collect our thoughts and, and share what, what's, uh, which factors we think might be affecting each of those students the most. Well, Tanya, if you're still here, I don't want to make you read by yourself. <laughs> I, I would feel like um, it's not detention or something. Um, it's we can talk about them out loud, just the two of us, or um, or if you want the rest of your afternoon back, that's okay too. <laughs> it's it's a private lesson now. What would, what would you like? <laughs> we can skip ahead to the strategies. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so I know, sorry, I'm like literally in the middle of everything. So um, I was gonna say, if you don't mind giving me like five minutes and then I'll go to the strategies with you. Sure, yeah, okay. absolutely. All right. I'll be okay, here. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Okay, I'm sorry. I'm like, so I don't know how much I'm going to be able because now I'm I'm in done. <laughs> it's, we've got everybody around me. Um, that's no, why my I camera's like been off for like most of the day. That's that's how how it is in our field. <laughs> it's a very real world example you're bringing to the table. So, I know, and I literally when I I thought it was funny, I had to walk away to go translate, and I was like, what are the odds? Um, so. But um, I mean, I guess at this point, you know, you're kind of free too. So <laughs> um, it, I definitely feel like you've provided a lot of information, a lot of um, areas to like dive into a little bit further. And then um, I do have a high, huge percentage of um, Spanish speakers here. So like I do all the, um, I am also a district translator for my district. So I do all the um, confidential documentation, all that kind of stuff. So, and um, and it was funny when we were reading the boxes from earlier, I was like, man, I don't fit in any of these technically. I said, because I had education in both. So I can literally sit down and write, like I do a paper in English, a paper in Spanish. So um, with correct grammar. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh but yeah i don't know i'm like is there anything else that you wanted to share that we didn't go over um i guess i mean i can i can relate this is a story i shared this morning but one of the reasons why this is so why i care so much about this topic is because i i am in a family that's not multilingual because my family my when my family came to the United States, it was like, you couldn't speak your home language or, you know, just not, not good. And so, so everyone in, um, in their, their nuclear families was like, okay, English only, English only. Um, but I, I'm multi, a mixed race. And so I straddle these like different cultures. And so for, I never felt, um, this enough or that enough. I never fit into this this side of my family or that side of my family and at school like nobody knew what box to put me in because everyone as kids like they everyone is like self self-segregating and so for me it was just well I don't I'm not that enough I'm not that enough and I don't know and so um grow, like culture has always been really important to me and language has already always been really important to me but it does it always has kept me on the outside where I can speak this I can speak that now I can speak this but I'm not one of anything I've always felt on the outside so this this is to me this material is so important because we can all apply it in different ways um we have another participant <laughs> we can all apply it in different different ways in different contexts and um whether we're multilingual or um newcomer we have all experienced in one context or another being an outsider being that fish out of water not quite fitting in and so i feel like it's just so applicable and so so it's it's just really important to me i want i want everybody to like have these <laughs> these lessons and um because yeah, I think we can, when every single person can think of a way that it like speaks to them or matches an experience that they've had, even if just one experience one time. I, I totally agree with you because uh, just for me personally, so I'm um, married in mixed uh, background. So my children are mixed already. So then I also have myself. So I'm um, so Mexican and then um, my dad even though he wasn't raised there, but he's Puerto Rican. So even the Spanish language itself is a completely different world. Mm -hmm. And um, when you listen to Puerto Ricans talking, I mean, I don't understand half of what they're saying. I'm like, slow down, slow down. <laughs> so and, um, and then certain things have certain meanings elsewhere where you have to be super careful. So even in the translation and, and like you said, like knowing the backgrounds and basically um, trying to understand, you don't know, because uh, something that we say, like my mom would say, is very offensive in, for my dad and vice versa. And then how you said, like, even the belonging. So my kids themselves are like, 
Uh, so we're mixed, like, we don't even know how many times or, <laughs> and, yeah, so yeah. Then, and now they have children and they're mixed themselves and they're like, forget it. They're like, they don't have enough boxes. <laughs> so they, yeah. they check other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there aren't so, enough boxes anymore. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> it's also interesting. The boxes change depending where we are. I, um, you know, I, I was born in California. I'm back in California, but I was an educator for a while in Hawaii and the boxes there are completely different because the population is, the demographics are completely different. So, um, it's not just like Asian and this and this and this, like every Asian category, like you can, you can specify Cambodian, you can specify Lao, you can specify, um, Filipino, like everything is broken down so specifically, Guamanian and um, Chukis and um, Pompeian and like all of the different things. And I thought it's so it's so interesting wherever we go. And um, yeah, I don't know, that was a tangent, but <laughs> um, I, uh, I'd love to leave you with this. This is also at the bottom of this, this document. Um, um, I, I think page 25, you definitely already have a student in your head. So that's, that's just for someone who's like, like needs a guided reflection of like, hmm, who do I know that, like, what can I pull up to, to come up with my own example of a student? Um, but on page 26, um, the resources that I love are these, uh, the two videos, they're kind of, well, I think they're about 25 minutes each. So it's kind of, it's a commitment to watch them, but I really love them. It's some beautiful stories of students and their family members talking about their experience transitioning and trying to um, trying to be involved in, in school here in the United States. Um, the other thing that, and this is the, the one that I bolded is the supporting Multilingual Learners Part 2 Accompanying Toolkit. So I'll also drop that link in the chat box. But this document goes with the, um, the social emotional factors that we talked about today. And it offers some very specific um, strategies for based on the social emotional factors that we talked about, um, so how to create as inclusive and supportive a space uh, or an environment for our multilingual learners, our newcomer students. Um, the oh and the the row right above that the um um there's also for um a link to the outline um and the materials from this morning's session and the toolkit that went with that one which is strategies um to support multilingual learners based on typology so those links are in there too um and the evaluation link if you want extra credit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, that doesn't go to me at all. That's just feedback um, about the content that goes directly to whoever's up here making the curriculum in, in California School Age Consortium. I don't, again, I don't see it at all, but I do know that they like very much appreciate all feedback and they implement it right away because although I don't see the feedback, I see the changes. So I know that they're, I know that they're listening. I know that they're reading. Um, and if you want a certificate to say that um, you did it. You were here till the end. <laughs> um, and you put real life into practice during the session <laughs> with the translations. Um, uh, there's also a certificate link there. Um, the invitation that I always leave um, participants with at the end of these sessions is um, on page 27 and 28 is just this head, heart, and feet reflection. After participating, what is one thing you're thinking? What is one thing you're feeling? And what is one thing you're excited about doing or implementing? So you can share that with me if you want to, or you can just think about it, or you can write it down somewhere, either in the chat for us to see or in a notebook um, as a personal reflection, whatever will um, help you put closure on our 90 minutes, but also take this 90 minutes and build on this 90 minutes um, going forward. And, in your school district. Hi, uh, Delaney. I, I know I came in super late. Yeah, no worries. Hi, Tom. Um, if you just real quick, uh, if you could just tell me some of the key topics that you guys had covered. Um, uh, yeah, this. you can find us in this document. I just dropped a link into the chat. And yeah, I'm looking yeah. at it right now. Okay, super. So 
we uh, this is this is what we talked about today the this some different social emotional and um political and legal implications and experiences that are part of the multilingual learner um journey and yeah what 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 goes with them when they're coming into the classroom that maybe is not necessarily visible on the surface or could easily be mistaken as just oh they're not trying or oh they're not doing academics or oh no they're not doing this but really it's all of these other um yeah. layers and layers and layers yeah I, i'm uh i'm an immigrant as well and when i first came to this country english was a difficult language to adapt to and i remember um you know adjusting in the classrooms and coming and my parents being immigrants you know they weren't really strong in the english language and so what tools, I don't know if you guys discussed this, um, how are we helping the kids who are, you know, from obviously from different backgrounds, different cultures and languages, how are we providing resources and tools to them so that they can get the help they need um, if it's difficult for them at home? Yeah, absolutely. Um, may I ask just what your what your role is so I know where where within oh, okay. the education world you, you sit I, in, in, in relation to students uh -huh. or? administration i'm definitely not in a classroom uh, i work for cde i'm more of a researcher awesome oh that's so cool that's the dream <laughs> it's a dream i didn't know that I was... yeah, that's i would love to be there someday um <laughs> very much so um keep keep my name in your books <laughs> um uh yeah i so i um I, first let me check tanya do you how how are you feeling i can stay and chat with tom a little bit more if you are ready to move on with your day or if you want to hang out for a bit more what what, what would you I'm, like i'm good with hanging out and hearing the resources i know what we kind of do so i'd love to to hear more yeah. about that yeah tanya if you could just you know chime in because it sounds like you're already in the classroom already um if i can see so you're you're yeah. you're the front lines already. Yeah. You're in, <laughs> your, your input would be just as important because <laughs> you're facing this issue as it is, right? Correct. So, um, and that's kind of why I picked this class uh, to begin with. So we have a huge um, low socioeconomic demographics, but uh, definitely a lot of uh, Spanish. So our um, cell kids, and then. So resources, just trying to figure out how to implement that. Obviously we have our you know, basic um, programs, but I'm looking for things that we can implement in an after school program, um, support. And most of the time we get the kids that um, need that extra instruction, that need that extra time building on their language in the after school program session. And so providing um, materials that they can relate to um, helping the instructors try to figure out you know what kind of um, activity centers they do to help support and build their vocabulary but that's fun and uh, not a consistent you know well I'm gonna I'm gonna age myself here with a ditto sheet or a worksheet <laughs> so that kind of stuff um, hands-on learning that kind of thing so yeah yeah, and so Tom, I can share it from my perspective. I started out as a classroom teacher, um, and I, I was so I was working. I was teaching science and math to students from diverse backgrounds, di um, dis disabled students, and um, students coming from different countries, either environmental refugees or political refugees. Um, a lot of multilingual learners. Um, but again, my subject was science and math, but it does, it comes with all of that extra helping facilitate the conversations between other teachers who maybe don't have um, like the same language skills or the same cross-cultural communication skills um, or like the same sensitivities or whatever, um, helping bridge the conversations for those students who had family members with them, um, bridging those conversations between administrators and the family members, most of my students didn't have any family members with them. They had come over from their home countries um, and just kind of, I don't want, I, without this having any sort of negative connotation, but like got, you know, plopped into this community of more and more youth that were coming from these countries and just becoming um, crowded into 
um, affordable housing units or things like that. And so, yeah. so much of the teacher's role at that point in time, at least, isn't anything that where we're given a script, isn't anything where we're given a strategy or here's a how-to book. It's really just navigating, okay, who are you? Tell me, tell me what you like. Well, even before the tell me your story, it's that building that trust, building that relationship, and as a, you know, as a trusted adult in their life. And then going from there, learning about that student, learning where they're coming from and what they're bringing to the table, and then helping connect them with any possible resources. So a lot of it, at, at least at that point in time, falls on the educator to, um, if they are a self-starting educator, um, and, and not just a, well, whatever, it's not my problem, <laughs> educator, um, but, but to figure out, okay, well, what resources are there? Who can I connect them to? Um, how can I get them to, how can I connect them to um, food support or um, uh, resources for clothing or resources for um, other housing options where they are not going to be um, crowded into this home, but maybe have have more space and more access to health and wellness and that type of thing. Um, a homework center and additional academic um, supports. From there, I pivoted into college access, uh, college access work because that um, enabled me to work slightly beyond just the confines of my science or math classroom, and I was able to work then with fifth graders all the way through 12th graders. Um, and to me, college access is more than just like, okay, by the way, take the SATs or here's, it's not test prep. Um, college access, it goes beyond that to where um, I did become that person who kind of knew where where everything was, who, who could help with whom. I did a lot of just networking in the community to know um, what positive role models are out there, bringing in like, you know, maybe a lawyer or um, a, a, a caterer or people from a lot of different professional fields, different scientists, marine biologists, um, and just connecting those mentors and building bridges that where there weren't bridges. Um, and so I really, I don't know how well this is answering your question, but at least at this, at that point, a lot of it is just like creating resources, making resources, curating resources. Um, and this point, um, going from college access to, um, to what I'm doing now, which is just, I'm the, the professional development trainings that I facilitate are, um, different strategies for, uh, I've, I, I work especially with like young educators, but, um, in, in like coaching them a little more hands-on, but in general with these types of professional development trainings, um, there's, there's mostly strategies for somebody who is on the ground in a direct service position working with the students. And it's, it's just little simple fixes, like those little, um, like, oh, you know, if you switch this word around, this might make somebody feel a little more welcome or a little more seen or heard or valued or included. Um, when you say this, this might, be interpreted as this or come across this way and so it's sometimes it's just little language changes that um change a whole tone or a whole um sense of belonging or um yeah that that type of thing um sometimes and this um uh sometimes it's as simple as um or not not necessarily simple none of this is just depends <laughs> simple or not simple but um creating a mentor program building in opportunities into an existing program or an existing classroom space um where a um a, a native english speaker works with a non-native english speaker and bridges that cultural gap without saying oh choose your partner in which case students are kind of self-selecting and going with people that are familiar, going with culture that is familiar, um, rather than coming, um, in this case, as far as language development, coming into contact with each other, exposure to native English speakers speaking English um, with, an, with like the California accent or, or that type of thing, the California culture. Um, and so by, by designing the program or building in certain structures, certain routines, into a program um, where it's just it's just built in, it's just natural, it's just part of the program, then organically 
these types of relationships happen where they wouldn't have organically happened without that sneakily built in structure. I'm not sure, are, are any of these, are, is this helping at all? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good information. Um, it sounds like you guys are pretty much left to fend for yourself. Yes, yes. That is my any, experience um, on the ground. Yeah. Now that I'm the person who has the little tips and tricks and I'm, I'm helping, um, it's, it's a little bit different. But on the other side, it's there isn't any sort of handbook. It's not built into the lessons. It's not built. It's not built into Common Core. <laughs> but as but no matter what subject you're teaching, you're navigating these types of interactions and these types of student experiences. Yeah, I was wondering if there was some some kind of policy or um, you know if certain uh, school districts had a structure behind it as far as a, a, a you know well organized approach. Yeah, I can't speak to every school district. Um, I have worked with a few school districts in various um, various positions along the way, and each district has a different approach. Um, the most recently, I was working with Alam Rock Union in East San Jose, and this was a school district where I was sitting on the, the board uh, for the ethnic studies committee. And so we were working on a proposal for the school board to, um, to approve to move forward ethnic studies curriculum, which the strategies that, that we were bringing to the table are suggesting is that ethnic studies isn't a class, for example. Ethnic studies is, is a way of being is what we were trying to sell. And it's a way of um, kind of putting all of these types of little strategies together into professional development trainings um, rather than into, it's not necessarily, it's not explicit content for students to learn and, and acquire, but it's um, training and mentality, ways of thinking, ways of being, ways of, it's pedagogy really for like how the teachers are teaching whatever subject it is that they're teaching. Um, how How are they communicating with um, family members or students, how, like what language are they using to make their communication accessible, to make engagement possible at all. And um, so that I would say is an example of what this school district is doing that I would say is really is, is one way that this, that these strategies will eventually show up um, in like across the board, but it will take at least three years of um, consistent professional development throughout the year, um, depending what what pace, um, how many per year they end up able to approve and move forward financially. Um, but yeah, I would say I would say a huge a huge amount. And this is one thing that I that I hope I don't know what California Department of Education does yet from the state level, but this is where I'm hoping to like work my way up and and help be part of the team and the that creates these these types of this not necessarily one size one not a one size fits all how to but puts together compiles curates all of these strategies um, to support all of our school districts all of our county offices of education in delivering these and equipping the the educators who are on the ground with students to um, to teach in this way, to talk in this way, to interact in this way with their with their children and youth and, and family members um, in ways that that help um, that cross the language gaps and culture gaps and help eventually we won't need to build bridges because there just there just won't won't be gaps anymore and we'll all like just cross-cultural communication skills, I think, because it goes it goes both ways. The, it's not just about developing learners. Um, it's, we're also learners in, in the whole process. I think we're learning from and with, um, with our youth and children and their families. Yeah, that's, thank you for that information. Um, are, are you currently a teacher? No, no. Um, right now I'm, I'm a senior certified trainer with California School Age Consortium. So I, I facilitate these and that's, that's, that's about it at the moment. Um, but I came, I came from teaching to college access work, um, and from college access work, um, I was a, a site director for a little bit with a um, 
with a nonprofit organization uh, doing out of school time work in um, in San Jose, and then from there, um, or currently just just this. Got it. Um, thank you for all your your work. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. No worries. It's this is what it's my passion. <laughs> I can't see myself doing anything else but trying to trying to help um, make the world more inclusive and compassionate and effective in sustainable ways. That's tremendous. I wish. Uh, I, I mean, I, that's the goal. I hope we can yeah. reach that. <laughs> I think that's why we do what we do. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. Thank you so much for popping in. I know it was the very end, and I'm sure you've been trying to get as much as you can from every session you could attend. So, yeah, I saw this, and I was like, "Wow, this is something that is obviously, um, you know, it touches me because I grew up in, in that situation, and I've always wondered if things that are better, or you know, for the current students, because um, I remember growing up, and uh, you know, just noticing the difficulties that students were having and um, noticing that some of the teachers were not really armed with the best resources to deal with the yeah. multitude of issues that come up. So I've always wondered, um, you know, what's out there? Yeah. What's, what kind of options, what kind of resources are out there for the teachers, yeah. the schools? I would say it's still very much that. I would say in, in so many cases, it's not teachers to blame. It really is teacher development and, and staff development and even leadership development. How, how, are, how is the field equipping our administrators, our superintendents, as well as um, our principals and our teachers on the ground? I think that that's a huge bit is, is I do think it, a lot of it is lacking. And so I think, I think that that's a huge thing. And I do think that unfortunately, and this is, this is what makes me sad is, is there is a level of unfairness. And this is why when I was a kid, I always knew what I wanted to go do was, was I saw that it so much was luck of the draw. Do you get a teacher who cares and is going that extra mile to figure out how they can help you? Yeah. Or do you get a teacher who is there to sit at a, sit behind a desk and, you know, it's a free for all for the students and um, and that doesn't help the students who um, aren't, aren't don't already have the equipment to navigate the system that is unfamiliar or in a different language in a different culture and all of these things. So I do think that there's still a huge amount of that is just what teacher do you get, but I think that also the more that we provide our teachers as far as resources, um, trainings, um, materials, I think that we can make that gap smaller and smaller and smaller until we don't need a bridge. So you experienced um, the same things as far as um, were you were you attending ESL as, as a as a kid yeah. or no so I might have I might have shared this right before you got back uh, you got into the room um so my, I did grow up in or like was born in California but you um, moved to Hawaii. And, yeah 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 so I was in California moved to Hawaii and um and then I was uh, overseas for quite a while um and then came back to California um but my story growing up is that I my when my family came to the States, it was during a time where they had to speak English or else. Um, and with, uh, like with, for risk of um, persecution from the American government. And so my parents only spoke English at home and in the house, I only learned English, but I am mixed race. My um, parents' families Im immigrated here from different, um, completely different cultures and different countries, different continents and so um I, sure. I never yeah so I never felt like one of anything and I never yeah. growing up I I never fit into any of the boxes and students self separate into like you know like goes with like and I didn't match any of it and so I always felt like an outsider and I always was you know observing all of these different ways that different different students were being treated and um and that for me, like drove me to self-teach as many languages as I could learn. Um, and, and just, I've always 
just been, I've been very interested in exploring and learning as, about as many cultures as I could. Um, so which and, cultures are you, what is your background? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, uh, my, my father's family is from the Philippines. And then my mom's side of the family is Ashkenazi Jewish. So from Eastern Europe. Oh, wow. And yeah, and um, both both came because of because of persecution and then risked persecution once they got to the States. Um, so there were there was definitely that experience. And um, it wasn't until I was an adult that I had a conversation with them about my experience being mixed that neither of them had. They had the experience of being an Eastern European Jew and being a very dark skinned Filipino um, navigating life here. Um, and so that was that had its own challenges. And I had this very distinct challenge of being mixed and not fitting either group. So nobody knew how to treat me. Nobody, <laughs> nobody. So I was, I was bullied for being different. But I rather than being bullied for being this or bullied for being that it was just like, what are you? <laughs> you know? um, and so so um, but that that really from the very beginning, I always knew that I wanted to be breaking down those barriers and um, working toward equity in our um, education system, because also like that to me, it's it's opportunity access in general. I think that um, all of this, the systemic inequities and injustices and inhumanities even um, within healthcare and within um, economics and um, housing and everything, it all, it all is all about opportunity and that all comes through the education channels, the way our systems are built right now. It's all about, you know, it's, it's a, um, a, a masquerading as meritocracy, but um, so I think, yeah, so for me, it all comes down to like, we got to transform the education system. We got to make a new, a new, new system. And um, one that, yeah, one where we're, where we're helping each other and <laughs> lifting each other that's up. A, so. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I understand, you know, your background. I come from immigrant family from yeah. East Africa, and so um, it was a struggle coming yeah. here as you know, five years old, and just going through the American school system, mm -hmm. trying to understand, master the language, and going home, and your parents don't really speak the language yeah. at all, or yeah. understand the culture. Right. It's difficult, and so I've always, you know, had a uh, desire to see if things have changed, if things are better, and to really learn from it. Yeah. Um, but. I want to thank you for your time. Um, I have to get going, but I'm going to share my email with you. If you, uh, thank you so much. yeah, awesome. Thank, thank you very much, Tom. Um, yeah, I'd love to connect some more and um, chat. And I hope I answered some of your questions. I think the moral of the story is it's changing, but it's not. Right probably that different from when you were going through it yet right yeah. right it, yeah one of the things that we were talking about right before you got into the room is the weight that still falls on students to be that translator for for their families and um i shared a story about one of my um students who um all, like you is from from east africa who um carries that weight of translating oh, yeah. Um, like any time a grade report goes home and then there's that, well, I don't really want to tell my family these grades, but like they know that I got my grade report. And so, you know, just so much, so many, so many different layers and things yeah. to mitigate. So. Yeah. So it, it, uh, yeah, it, it's hard. It's difficult. So, yeah. but um, thank you. I really appreciate this. Um, yeah. If look forward to, uh, if you have any information, you can always reach out. Um, like I said, I, I'm trying to do um, some research work on declining enrollment. That's what I'm focusing on right now. Um, but yeah. If, yeah, if there's any- God, I can say a lot from first, like on the ground. So yeah. much is because of the, uh, 
like just just gentrification the people are moving away they we can't right. afford life here anymore right. so that is a huge part but we actually had my alum rock had a bunch of schools shut down um this school year so yeah. cool. I, that, thank you De <laughs> thank you delaney i yeah. appreciate thank it you. absolutely have a great rest of the day you as well take care thank you yeah bye mm -hmm.